A lot of you know Symantec by a lot of different faces. I'm going to share one with you that you might know a little bit less. Uh, over the course of the last couple of years, we've embedded security into more than a billion different things. Um, automotive systems, industrial control systems, critical infrastructure, medical equipment, all kinds of devices from 8-bit, 8 megahertz, 2K of SRAM, you know, 1980s grade chips, all the way up to 64-bit you know, um, uh, you know, exciting kinds of uh, things across the full range of the Internet of Things. My personal background, because I want this to be interactive, um, I've spent 20 years building security into all kinds of things. Aviation, aircraft, spacecraft, uh, aviation ground stations, cellular base stations, um, all kinds of fixed infrastructure, mobile vehicles, etc. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and dive right into it. So why are we investing so much energy in protecting the Internet of Things? We're really excited about how the technology can change our lives, whether it's um, you know, your car that can stream navigation data to ease your commute home in Los Angeles traffic tonight, uh, or um, my favorite medical example is they have a contact lens now uh, that can measure your blood glucose and let you know visually uh, if, uh, if your numbers are off. It's a prototype, of course. But in big industries uh, like uh, aviation, a small change of 1% can produce billions of dollars of savings. And so that's driving a lot of the hype of the trillion dollar economic impact and all of the investment around IoT, examples like that. Now, a lot of people don't believe the huge projections of billions and billions of devices. But the reality is the semiconductor industry is already producing tens of billions of microcontrollers of smart chips for smart products already. The big difference as we roll the clock forward is that those things are becoming connected, either connected to the internet directly or indirectly through home networks, factory networks that are then connected to the enterprise. But it's tens of billions of things that are, that are connected. Now that connectivity both has the chance to, uh, to improve our lives dramatically, but it also has the chance to be an avenue for very you know, uh, bad people to do very bad things. Um, so this is not a doom and gloom prediction slide. These are things that have already happened, including a three kiloton pipeline explosion that happened in a fortunately uninhabited area years ago. We've all seen the videos of cars hacked and driven off the road. Hospitals, three hospitals that was disclosed in June were infected through medical devices like MRI machines, X-ray machines, and blood gas analyzers. You know, medical equipment that you don't expect to have enough vulnerability to, be, to pose a liability to the rest of the network, and yet, yet they do. Steel mill blast furnace, that was December of last year. It got hacked through a gateway designed to protect the operational network from the IT network, and the attack went straight through that gateway and damaged the blast furnace of a steel mill. Um, hospitals, cars stolen. Oh, not only have cars been hacked and driven off the road in proof of concept, but in a couple of parts of the world, a lot of cars have been stolen in large numbers because of mistakes made in the keyless entry systems. Simple authentication, you know, not, not building these security into these systems right. Oh, and the wearables that we're all so fond of, um, you know, choose your device of, uh, you know, quantified self uh, fitness band. Uh, most of them expose Bluetooth in ways that are not privacy friendly in ways that allow the users to be tracked, including tracked from halfway around the world. Um, home automation equipment. Not only can you search Shodan right now and pull up uh, you know, uh, pictures and videos of uh, baby cameras watching babies sleep, uh, but you can get into industrial control systems the same way. Uh, and um, did a survey last year. Home automation equipment. They looked at nine different of the leading products out there. Nine of the nine had serious vulnerabilities. Seven of the nine had multiple serious vulnerabilities. So across the board, one of the things we've realized is people don't really understand what it means to build security into these systems. So it's one of the reasons we're out there and giving talks on what does it really mean to protect these systems. But to a lot of people, they think of security as you add a feature to something. Like, um, you know, I'll pick a random piece of furniture like a chair in a room, and I'll really lock that down and ignore the fact that there are all kinds of other windows and doors into the room, and everything else can get stolen. Security needs to be comprehensive. So if you're really going to protect the system, it needs to be from the lowest layers of the silicon to the loftiest layers of the cloud, protecting every potential weakest link in between, because if you don't do that, the adversaries are going to exploit those weakest links. So what does that mean in an IoT context? That's one of the things we'll be talking about today and also talking about how to then apply it to critical verticals like industrial controls, automotive, medical, and the like. 
So as we do that, though, one of the big differences that we have to realize, especially as a professional community of, of software engineers, is that the way security gets delivered into this world is very different than it used to be. I mean, years ago, if you were going to deliver security, you'd just write a you know, cute little uh, bit of uh, software that could run on a single operating system that ran on more than 90% of the personal computers out there, and you'd mint a lot of money. Um, if you were making hardware, you didn't worry so much about security because you knew that the enterprise was going to add security software later, or the consumer would just slip a disk of their security software in and add the security later. You can't slip a disk into a multi-hundred thousand dollar industrial robot. You can't slip a disk into a programmable logic controller to add security later. You can't slip a disk into your wearable to add security, and you can't modify your, your favorite uh, you know, home thermostat. These things either have to have security built in by the manufacturer, or they're not going to get security. They're both technical countermeasures where the manufacturers are trying to pre prevent against modification for good reason. You don't want the aggressors modifying these devices. They don't always do it perfectly, but they also have legal countermeasures, warranty clauses, support clauses, and the like, for you know, discouraging people from modifying these things. And now, it, it, you know, it might be an option for a hobbyist to maybe modify their home thermostat and violate those warranty clauses, but for the industrial internet of equipment that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's really not an option to, to invalidate that capitalized equipment. So for those reasons, security really has to be built in either by the manufacturer or by security professionals working in collaboration with the manufacturer. It's a big shift in how security gets delivered into the ecosystem. As engineers, there are a lot of other differences, not just this, this big shift between uh, systems being open or closed to such modification. But if you look at the fragmentation, I want to talk about fragmentation really at three levels. At the silicon level, at the software layer, and at the protocol layer. Because in, in each of those, in the silicon layer, you know, it used to be everything ran sort of an x86-ish uh, architecture. Well, in the IoT, you have 8-bit AVR, 16-bit microcontrollers, 32 and 64-bit ARM, in addition to x86, x64, and you have more than a dozen vendors. At the operating system layer, just above the hardware, leading in a lot of verticals, the leading vendor of operating system, or the, the leading distribution, has at most a 6% market share. So if you want to support the majority of the, op of, of the market, you have to build for 10 different operating systems. Quite different than sort of the monoclonal era that we had before this. And if you move up to the protocols, that level is even more fragmented. So you look across a dozen verticals, each of which have, again, about a dozen or so leaders, who each have their own proprietary protocols, and actually have a dozen or so variants of those proprietary protocols. And those proprietary protocols are often ill-documented, documentation not publicly available. You literally, literally have dozens of dozens of dozens, so more than a thousand variants of these protocols, mostly proprietary, mostly ill-documented. So if you're going to add security into this world, it's sort of very, very different than the everything being TCP IP on you know, one flavor of OS on an x86 architecture. So that means we have to work a lot more collaborative. We've had to work a lot more collaboratively with the people building these systems on how you embed security into these systems. So to do that, it's helped to sort of frame things in a common architecture and boil them down into simple cornerstones or ingredients for building security into things. So when I talk about a simple architecture, nearly all of these IoT systems have sort of a, a bottom, a foundational layer of devices and sensors and actuators and the like. And those are often controlled by a, a higher layer that's either running in the cloud or a data center, but servers of some type that are really controlling these IoT systems. You might or might not have a gateway in between connecting them. And those are sort of the three layers of abstraction. And then as we talk about the cornerstones of security for what it really means to build security into these systems, we start with protecting the communications between these devices so that they know how to trust each other. We, talked about, we will talk about protecting the devices individually, and we'll talk about managing the security in these devices because security is never done. And if you're not nimble, your adversary is. And last, no matter how well you do each of those first three cornerstones, there are going to be sophisticated adversaries out there who are able to overcome those first three cornerstones. And to combat those, you need a sophisticated analytics capability to find the footprints in the sand of the adversaries who aren't going to trip any tripwires. 
So those four cornerstones, protecting the communications, protecting the device, managing the device over time, and then really understanding your system to detect those really sophisticated adversaries. Those are what we consider sort of the four cornerstones. I'll go into a little bit of detail on each. So protecting the communications is one of the areas that has, I think, s some of the most misconceptions. A lot of people look at these extremely constrained devices and say that you can't do security in these extremely constrained devices. They don't have the CPU power or they don't have the battery power. Well, first, let me define what I think it means to build security into the communications layer for these devices. Then on the next slide, I'll show that you can do this even in surprisingly constrained devices. Build seriously strong security even into these 1980s grade 8-bit, eight 8 megahertz type chips. So when we talk about the security that needs to get built into these things, we find in many of these Internet of Things systems, authentication is the fundamental requirement. There are a lot of cases that, believe it or not, encryption you know, content secrecy is, is not actually a requirement. When you're driving your car, you really don't care if anybody knows what the engine temperature is. But you do care that that engine temperature isn't spoofed, because if the engine temperature is spoofed, it can send your car into shutdown modes that you probably don't want to be doing on the freeway at, you know, 70 or 80, 90 miles an hour, or what, whatever speed you're driving. So authentication is always a requirement. Encryption might or might not be a requirement for privacy reasons. But one of the common patterns that we see, because a lot of the data in the Internet of Things is often passed around from a collection sensor, uh, handed off uh, maybe through a mesh network of a couple of hops, maybe through a gateway, sent up to a cloud service, and then maybe shared across a couple of cloud services. An increasingly common pattern that we're seeing is signing the data object on capture so that wherever that data goes, it can be authenticated. That both has valuable security properties of being able to authenticate that data wherever it goes, know the pedigree of the information as well as the integrity of the information. But it also can be a lot more battery friendly than decrypting and re-encrypting this data at every hop across that complex system. So for, for this audience, I mean, you're, you're familiar that you know, crypto libraries are required. I'll touch on them a little bit on the next slide because that's where a lot of uh, engineers go wrong, uh, not knowing about some of the libraries that can work in these extremely constrained devices. Um, beyond the libraries, you obviously need keys, credentials, things like certificates. Um, and we're encouraging people to build roots of trust into these IoT devices. One of the things that we see right now is that a lot of these devices are currently communicating mostly in sort of islands of ecosystems uh, in their own little universe. Uh, but as they increasingly talk to each other, uh, being able to at least authenticate another device that comes from another ecosystem you know, requires having a common root of trust so that you can at least evaluate the certificate. It's still a policy-based decision on whether or not you trust that remote device, but unless, it, unless you at least have a mutual root of trust to evaluate each other's certificates, it's, a, it's tough. It gets into sort of an N-squared mess of, uh, of cross-signing and just a, a place that we don't want to be in at scale. Um, I'm going to skip the, uh, the advertisement for certificate authorities. Um, and I'm going to get right into busting the myth that these extremely limited devices can't do meaningful security, uh, because they can. The, the example that I like to give, you've heard me mention it a couple times, 8-bit, 8, 8 megahertz, 2K of static RAM. The crypto that I like to mention is um, uh, elliptic curve with a 256-bit key length. I go there because that's effectively a strong, or actually stronger, by most cryptanalysis estimates, stronger than RSA 2048, which is best practice, financial services, military grade crypto. So what a lot of people don't realize is that elliptic curve runs 10 times more efficient than RSA, 10 times easier on the battery than RSA, 10 times faster in compute than RSA. So that's incredibly valuable in these extremely limited devices. So, for instance, even an 8-bit, 8, 8 megahertz uh, chip can do this in about 20, 25 seconds. Um, now, you have to use the nano implementation of elliptic curve to do that. You can't use, uh, you know, OpenSSL is just not going to run in 2K of static RAM, for instance. <laughs> um, so you have to know the right library to use, but there are good libraries out there. And, of course, you know, 20 seconds, 25 seconds is, uh, is not very fast. It's often not fast enough for the engineering requirements. But the reality is, I mean, this is an early 1980s grade chip. Um, 
the 16-bit chips that are out there right now, uh, you know, cost 25 cents, um, and it's been about a decade since the 16-bit chips eclipsed, eclipsed the 8-bit chips in popularity in terms of what's shipping by, by volume. So if you need a, a chip, if you need to do a crypto in faster than 20 or 25 seconds, which most of us do, you know, I invite those engineers to step out of the 80s and at least step into the 90s with a 16-bit or, uh, you know, 32-bit chip that might only cost 50 cents. I love a lot of the ARM chips. There are ARM chips out there right now, the physical width of a human hair, that can do crypto at, at speeds, you know, pretty close to this, you know, 100 milliseconds is what you're seeing in the 80 megahertz case. But physical width of a human hair run on the energy powering of a bridge vibration salted into concrete using just a little MIMS accelerometer to capture the bridge vibration, convert that into uh, to electrons. Um, you know, with, uh, with chips like that costing uh, 50 cents each, um, I don't see how uh, physical size, cost, compute power, uh, battery usage, I'll watch th walk through the battery numbers here, but I, I don't see how those are viable excuses anymore for not building security into these systems that are so tangible in our lives. In some cases, with vehicles and aircraft and industrial control systems, we're literally betting lives on these systems. So to not build security into them, in many ways, in my mind, is, is, is reprehensible. So the millijoules over here, because I, I suspect most of us are software engineers, not hardware engineers in the room. Um, the 14 and 16 millijoules, uh, that is uh, such small battery drain that you could sign an object every hour for decades and only use a slice of a AA battery. So it's like, why? who cares about a AA battery? Well, it turns out in the industrial internet, you have these things like pipelines uh, that ship oil and gas you know, up and down them, but don't have a lot of electrical distribution along them. And you literally want these unattended sensors to last decades out there in the cold, because just simply changing a battery, you got to roll a truck hundreds of miles. And so to be able to last decades, even in these older chips, is, uh, is, is very, very valuable in some cases. I, uh, I like to really tap, tip my hat as well to Ken McKay for doing the micro implementation of elliptic curve. The micro implementation runs a lot faster. Um, that's uh, about 100 milliseconds, but it also has a relatively small uh, memory layout. Uh, you can run it in uh, you know, less than uh, 3K of static RAM, uh, and it runs fast in, uh, in less than uh, 7K of, of static RAM. Uh, so I, I really like to tip my hat to him. Uh, these are his numbers, so I you know, disclose copyright there. Um, and uh, for, for Ken McKay's uh, layout on chips like that, uh, under 23 millijoules, so almost as battery efficient as, uh, as, as running at 8 bit, 8 megahertz, but you're running uh, you know, in, uh, in just a few seconds. Um, so I, I, think that's, I think that's quite valuable. So you're going to want crypto like that for authentication to authenticate communications, but you're also going to want crypto like that so that as the device boots, you know that you're booting the code that you want the device to run and not somebody else's code. And so that's one of the things that we sort of consider fundamental in protecting the device is that you build security from the ground up. And so when I say from the ground up, I'll talk through examples both with uh, operating systems and without operating systems. But you want to make sure that the device drivers, the network stack, and the operating system are all properly signed. You want to make sure that any application code running at the next layer is properly signed. Any cryptographic libraries, such as OpenSSL uh, or anything else, Nano ECC, that they're properly signed. We also encourage companies to really protect the device against runtime attacks, and we'll get into this later. Uh, but you want to have some sort of a network monitor watching the data coming into the device to make sure that you're not seeing malicious data come in there, or at least do anomaly detection to notice when things are looking suspicious. Um, and you're going to have some settings on that device. It's perfectly valid from a security perspective to sign all of that as a monolithic image. And that's incredibly common in the embedded world of IoT. But it's equally valid from a security perspective to sign it in a more granular fashion, to sign just like we do in mobile, for instance, maybe an operating system image that includes the board support layers and sign each of the applications individually and sign settings uh, atomically. Now that starts to take us down an interesting path that we, when we get to managing the device over time, if you need to update any one of these, they can be updated at a very granular level. You don't need to update the whole image, you just update that slice. In fact, if you take signing to the next level, where the applications, the operating system image, are actually signed in small pages or blocks of maybe 40k bytes each, 
you can update individual blocks surgically rather than having to update the whole uh, the whole OS. Uh, now, if you're uh, you know trying to update a multi gigabyte image, it's obviously a lot better to update just a few K. So I mentioned this works with or without an operating system. Um, uh, this this layout uh, you know has the device drivers, the network stack, uh, the crypto libraries, the network monitor, and the uh, the primary code for the device all compiled together into one monolithic blob. Um, even then, signing can be at a much more granular uh, level if you have a good pre-boot environment that can handle that. But that just ensures that you boot the device into a relatively safe state. Never run unsigned code, never run unsigned configuration data, never trust unsigned data. But in addition to that, we need to protect against runtime attacks, against malicious data that might be coming to the device. In this runtime, it needs to be different than a lot of you know, the, the techniques that we've seen in the personal computer era. Um, it needs to be effective even when it's disconnected. That means it needs to be whitelist based, not based on blacklists. It needs to be effective even if it never gets updated. It needs to be based around policies. It needs to protect the system itself, both internally as well as any network interfaces coming into the system. And to do that, it really needs to fit the targeted system. So if you're running a, uh, a, a no OS, a no operating system uh, type uh, chip, uh, that means you're probably going to need to try to accomplish a lot of that by compiling it into uh, the, the code of the application itself and using some compiler-based strategies as well. But if you're running an operating system, there are good third-party solutions out there that do that, uh, that do all of this. Um, and the last thing that I'll mention here is that that host-based security should feed a bigger analytics solution. Uh, because you're going to see anomalies down there that are going to be suspicious. And if that device starts misbehaving, you want to know what those anomalies looked like so that you can go look for them elsewhere. That goes back to the footprints in the sand because a lot of sophisticated adversaries don't trip any trip wires. So just to double click real quick on uh, a lot of the differences between traditional malware blocking and the sort of the, the whitelisting behavioral uh, uh, approach. So one of the things that we've done, and I, I, I will try to make this be the only slide differentiating our solution versus anyone else's, uh, but one of the things that we've done is we're not just whitelisting code, but we're whitelisting the behaviors associated with that code. So if somebody hacks that code with a, a runtime attack, uh, memory-based attack or anything else, and then it, it starts to misbehave, do something different than it's done before, we can block that. We can do that in extremely constrained devices. And that's very important for protecting against zero-day attacks in embedded systems. So having talked about protecting the communications and protecting the device, I want to talk briefly about what it means to manage security in these devices. So, I mean, to many of us, it's obvious the need to manage security in these devices, but the reality is a lot of these industrial systems are out there for 19 years on average. So when we're going into industrial settings, the people that we're dealing with are dealing with systems that were built 19 years ago. Um, so encouraging them to build in an update mechanism, it, it can be a learning curve. But the, the thing that we try to encourage them is to realize that vulnerabilities are coming out on a, on a daily basis. Um, you might not be able to patch systems on a daily basis, but leaving thousands of vulnerabilities unpatched for uh, a decade or two is, is just unwise. And even if you only get a maintenance window once a year, and most organizations get maintenance windows more often than not, I mean, it's tough to take a whole manufacturing floor offline uh, to, you know, you're not going to do that just to do a software update. But you often have to take the manufacturing plant offline to do other overhauls of hardware throughout the manufacturing line. So you get those maintenance windows. Usually it's more often than once a year, but even just once a year, over the course of a lifetime of hardware that's going to be in the field for 19 years, once a year is 19 times better than never. And to do those updates, to do them safely and securely, you need that update mechanism built in from the beginning. So as we're working with device makers, and we're working with people who own and operate large infrastructures for industrial control systems, industrial internet in general, that's why we're really encouraging them to build in these update mechanisms from the beginning. I mentioned before that doing that in a way that doesn't kill battery, that doesn't kill bandwidth, 
It's really essential to do that in a very granular fashion that you build in the code signing and the update mechanisms and the software inventory management capabilities that you're able to do updates in a very surgical fashion, updating block sizes of like you know 40k bytes uh, as opposed to trying to update an entire monolithic image. Just updating a single monolithic image, going back to the AA battery example, often would kill half of a battery, would kill, in their mind, 10 years worth of battery, just a single monolithic update. But at the same time, doing updates in a granular fashion, building that capability in, you could do hundreds or thousands of updates for less battery and for less bandwidth than monolithic updates. The bandwidth is really important in settings like automotive, where a lot of these updates, they're trying to push over cellular modems, where somebody's paying for that, for that bandwidth. So whether it's battery or bandwidth that you're trying to protect, granularity is your key to being able to update frequently at very, very low impact to your system. And of course, if you build a good over-the-air update system once, whether you're building it for security or building it for general management of your systems, you can reuse that same over-the-air management infrastructure for the same purpose. Build it right once, use it twice. If you've built something that can do um, uh, telemetry, you know, good telemetry management, good normal control of the system, use that to pull back your security telemetry. If you have a good infrastructure for pushing out security patches, use that to push out your functionality updates. So build a really good infrastructure once, build it safe and secure, and you'll enable yourself in lots of different dimensions. So, Having talked about the, the first three cornerstones of uh, protecting communications, uh, protecting the devices, and managing the devices, I want to talk about the fourth cornerstone. Because no matter how well you do those first three cornerstones, some threats are going to get past those defenses. And it doesn't matter whether you're managing a manufacturing plant, trying to protect a CAN bus or power generation. Detecting those threats requires you to have a strong understanding of what your system should be doing and what it's normally doing so that when it starts doing anything else, you can highlight those differences, those anomalies, and use those as sort of triggers for investigation to see if somebody is beginning to operate in your network. The good news is a lot of these machine learning techniques have been around for a long time, and there are ways to boil them down so that they can even run in a single board computer, such as running in a single board computer, you know, a little, uh, you know, your, uh, the in-vehicle infotainment system in your car has a little single board computer behind it, not that different than, say, a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone Black. And you can run a lot of these machine learning techniques on single board computers like that, embedded in automotive systems, in other vehicles, in industrial control networks, watching the bus, watching the network, looking for anomalies there. That's really important for a couple of reasons. Some of them including a lot of this infrastructure that's been around for 19 years, you know, even if it has the compute power to do the crypto that we were talking about, and even if it has the compute power that security could have been built into that system, it's a legacy system. It might not get updated for a long time. The manufacturer might not build security into it for a long time. So you want to have a way of watching the system as a whole and mitigating those risks as best you can when security can't properly be built into all of these endpoints. In analytics like this, you know, we and others like us have used these analytic capabilities to process, in some cases, trillions of security events per year to detect some of the most sophisticated threats going against a lot of different verticals, including IoT systems, point of sale systems, automatic teller machines, as well as industrial control systems. So the, the, the last that I'll speak to in terms of understanding your system is really around realizing in a lot of cases that your system is beginning to talk to other systems. And as you do that, you want to have insight into which of those other systems can you trust. And it helps to know the safety and risk in connecting to those other devices before, before you accept those connections. And that's where security service providers that have cloud-based infrastructure so that you can check the reputation of those systems can be, uh, can, can be helpful. Both reputation services and also security status protocols where you can find out from the other device some form of attestation about what kind of hardware-based root of trust does it have, what kind of hygiene has it had. So with, uh, with, with, those, uh, with those cornerstones covered, protecting the communications, protecting the devices, managing the devices over time, and an analytics capability to detect the, uh, the really sophisticated threats. Um, Total? Well, then I, I'm, I'm going to bore you with the automotive stuff, because. Uh, 
How many of you saw, I'm, I'm sure it's most of you, but uh, how many of you saw uh, the Miller and Vlasic uh, uh, attack this summer? Um, uh, so there were, there were actually about six different talks on hacking vehicles. Um, so one of the things that was uh, glossed over is uh, a lot of these vehicles, they have a telecommunications unit that's not just a GSM modem, but that telecommunications unit has its own real-time operating system. And there are vulnerabilities both in those real-time operating systems. There are also vulnerabilities not only in terms of what can come over at the internet protocol layer, but those modems themselves in the GSM protocols have vulnerabilities. And you can actually hack a modem just through those GSM protocols, and then you effectively have control over the single board computer, which in this case basically puts you directly on the CAN bus. And so a lot of these vehicles have multiple uh, modems in them. They might have a modem also plugged into the onboard diagnostics port here. And there's other sort of tampering and mischief that can get done via the onboard diagnostics port. Um, there are other wireless interfaces, supply chain risks, and the like. But I mean, the core security mistakes that were exploited this summer, executing unauthenticated commands. I mean, imagine your vehicle. It, a lot of, most of the vehicles today execute unauthenticated commands. Um, accepting unauthenticated connections, especially without any port or protocol restrictions. Um, and those port and protocol restrictions should be built into the, the, the front end of the vehicle. Anywhere you have a modem, you should be locking down ports, protocols, doing authentication right there so that you have strong control over who can connect to the vehicle. You're not trusting that to network providers as these vehicles roam. Um, other fundamental security mistakes made this summer, inadequate code signing. So, you know, one of the automakers, you know, was sort of aware that it might be possible to make the blinkers go uh, and turn up the stereo and the air conditioning, but they thought they were protecting things like vehicle speed, uh, direction, uh, brakes, acceleration, uh, protecting that, the high criticality CAN bus from the low criticality CAN bus with a gateway module or a gateway chip, um, uh, which they often call a security module. Well, if you're going to have something called a security module, I highly recommend you at least build code signing into that. Uh, because if you don't build code signing into that, you get what we saw this summer, which is where you know, a couple of bright folks like Miller and Vlasic realize not only can they change the volume, but if they just reflash that one little chip there, all of a sudden they can literally turn cars off the road. And one of the things I hadn't realized before this summer is a lot of the cars out there right now, their steering isn't rack and pinion hydraulic steering, it's electrical power assist. So once you hack the microcontrollers in the vehicle, you've literally got control over whether the vehicle goes left or right. And even if they had done code signing, this was a, a quick aside in a couple of the talks, um, there were memory corruption vulnerabilities that could have been exploited. So even if they'd gotten the code signing right, the code quality was poor enough and there was no independent third-party security from security professionals protecting that device. So I mean, they basically made three levels of mistakes on that one thing that they call a security module. Um, and that's in addition to a lot of these co cars and their in-vehicle infotainment systems. Uh, they're running uh, browsers and apps that have exploitable vulnerabilities. Uh, and I mentioned the vulnerable modems earlier. So one of the things that I, I like to get into, though, is what the automotive industry is, is doing. So I mentioned in over-the-air management, the uh, Open Mobile Alliance device management standards, uh, the OMA, DM, and SCOMO standards. We see those in most of the RFPs for over-the-air management of, of vehicle software. Um, for authentication, uh, the standards have come a long way. Not just the CAMP stuff, the collision avoidance metrics program for the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle-to-infrastructure, which gets a lot of press. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to your question in a minute. But, um, but putting a cryptographic bus into the vehicle leveraging some of the new standards from the Hirschteller Initiative, uh, the HISHI standards, and the, uh, the Evita standards uh, for putting crypto onto the CAN bus, I think are, are really exciting. They still have a lot of key management questions around that, and the reality is those standards are a couple years old now, but with sort of multi-tier supply chains, it takes years before you actually get hardware you know, into, into vehicles. So I'm, I'm glad to see the continued progress there. And that's on top of the analytics stuff and the runtime protection, secure boot, everything else. Uh -huh. so, uh, okay, you've been, uh, 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 I've got one, uh, you've been a great audience. Uh, thank you so much. Happy to take questions one-to-one uh, -one later. Thank you again.